Every area in all the parts of the world has those area-specific urban legends that just refuse to die. Whether the stories are about a haunted asylum on the outskirts of a city, or a creature that lives in a nearby wood, or even possibly that ghost that haunts that lonely stretch of road on the outside of town. There are always a common thread within these tales. No one's ever been to these places, seen those creatures, or witnessed any hauntings with their own eyes. There are members of every generation who proclaim that they know someone whose brother's best friend's sisters went to that haunted house with the 13 floors that used the real blood and snakes. Ooh, how scary. So scary, in fact, that no one made it all the way through. Those same people will swear by these stories without ever being able to provide any shred of evidence or a name of someone who could provide proof that the claims were real simply because everyone around here knows that it's a true story. Those storytellers eventually pass on the tales to their children who will modify them just enough to keep up with the changing times and so the cycle continues. I'm as skeptical as anyone when it comes to these stories, seeing as I was a junkie when I was younger, constantly searching for more terrifying stories about whatever area of the country I happened to be living in at the time. I even made up and spread a few of my own stories, some about a haunted pizza parlor in New York, my cousin's encounter with the Jersey Devil, or a personal favorite of mine, how my grandfather encountered a feral, human-like demon creature in the woods of Colorado. I even broke one of the massive rules of these stories by putting myself in them. Now, in uh, hindsight, I realized that this took a bit of guts, because I had to make sure I always told the same story in the same way each time. Surprisingly, no one ever really caught my bluff. Now, I like to think that I've had some sort of wonderful contribution to the various urban legends around the Midwest and Northeastern states. I moved quite a lot, to be frank. There was always such a surge of joy whenever I would wander the halls at a new school, and hear one of my classmates recounting one of my stories to another one of their friends, adding little bits here and there, of course. It was kind of like a massive game of telephone of sorts. I knew, of course, that the stories were complete bullshit, but I stood my ground when someone asked me about them. I would even manage to act a little bit scared, speaking with a shaky voice, or looking fearful when I would recount the situation that supposedly happened to myself. I suppose this aspect of my childhood is what has led to my current predicament, which I'll recount in full for the internet to take from it what they will. I've laid this introduction as a sort of disclaimer, aimed particularly at those who called my story into question. I've been like the boy who cried wolf for years, but I assure you, with every ounce of honesty and integrity I can muster at this time, that the wolf is all too real. From my introduction, it's probably apparent that I moved around the country quite a bit in my middle and high school years. Neither of my parents had anything to do with any branch of the armed forces. They just simply didn't tend to hang around any given place for too long. I suppose it had some sort of effect on me, but I wasn't hurt by it or anything. Growing up, I was a complete ham. I made friends very easily, was often a class clown, and because of that I was often disliked by my teachers. Again, this wasn't quite the issue as I was gone in another state by the next semester when it rolled around. My friendships were often fleeting, as were any positive relationships that I've ever had with any of my teachers. Because of the events that followed, my memory of this one teacher in particular is probably slightly skewed. but. I will attempt to give the least biased version of our friendship that I can. Mr. Mays was one of my social studies teachers in my early high school experience. Being older now, I can understand how horrible children can be to deal with around that age, and I respect him to no ends to how he was able to connect with his students. He seemed like one of us. He talked like one of us, made pop culture references that were current, listened to cool music, and sometimes he would even say hell or damned while he was giving a passionate lecture about the Native American history or something like that. 
A teacher that swore even just a little bit was the epitome of cool to a freshman in high school. My memories of Mr. Mays mostly stem from the way he really got into every little thing he did. The instance that is still very vivid in my mind, of course, was around Halloween of my sophomore year. Mr. Mays had the typical teacher decorations around the classroom, smiling jack-o'-lanterns and black cartoons, typical and boring in the minds of an egotistic high school student. However, on the 31st of October, when most other teachers were rolling their eyes about the fact that teenagers still took dressing up in costumes on Halloween seriously, Mr. Mays took the whole cool teacher approach and brought it to a new level. We walked into a classroom and we were surprised to find that the blinds had been drawn and sheets were over the smaller windows. Candles were lighting the room and a single frowning jack-o'-lantern was sitting on a stool in front of the desks. Mr. May sat at his desk just watching the students come into class and take their seats. He didn't have to ask anyone to be quiet because the moment everyone walked into the room they were either too excited to care about petty conversations or just simply too confused to bother with them. The students took their seats as Mr. Mays began his lecture, and he spoke as quietly as he could, you know, to set the mood. He sat in his chair right next to a jack-o'-lantern in the center of the room. Today's probably my favorite day of the year, class. Halloween's my favorite holiday, and I want to share it with you exactly why I love it so much. One girl raised her hand with a concerned look on her face. I'm pushing the due date for the papers to next Tuesday. Which Mr. May said without even bothering to look at the girl who simply put her hand down, looking around at the other students with a hint of embarrassment. The class erupted in quiet cheers and Mr. May simply waited for the inevitable silence. He began his story immediately after the class calmed down. I will attempt to recreate the story that Mr. Mace told that class that day. The way in which he told the story rendered the horror junkies speechless and the rest of the class terrified. The same girl who raised her hand to ask about the paper was holding her knees to her chest by the end of it, a look of terror permanently planted on her face. The important thing to know is what the story was about. The specifics slip my mind now and aren't too relevant. but. I'll try to recount the parts of the story that matter the most, but just simply don't hold me to it. Basically, Mr. Mays and his friends set out to road trip around the entire country after graduating from college. They took a truck, loaded it with camping gear, and set out to sightsee for the entire summer. The group went from Pinocos in New Jersey down to the coast of Florida, to New Orleans, to California, and up to Washington. From there, they would go down the Rocky Mountains of Colorado and head back home to New York. This concept of freedom to travel anywhere had the entire class hooked in an instant. Mr. Mays was just the fucking coolest teacher ever in my eyes. Being the adventurous college kids, the group didn't bring a map. There were no time constraints, so they just kind of drove in the general direction that they wanted to go, and eventually found a town to stay in, or some place that looked interesting. He told us that after spending a week in Colorado, he and his friends had to travel miles and miles through the corn and plains and more corn and corn. He assured us that they were either in Nebraska or Kansas when they decided to pool their extra cash to stay in a hotel for another night. They settled into a motel room in some town that Mr. May says he can barely remember the name of. When one of his friends realized that they were somewhere near his grandfather's farm, he wasn't entirely sure where it was, but being the adventurous college kids they were, they decided to get a quick refund from the motel and try to contact this friend's grandpa. They were unable to get a hold of the grandpa on the phone, so the group figured it would be fun just to show up. Mr. May's friends was adamant that the grandparents would just take him in and feed him without a moment of hesitation, so the group set out without it, with only an hour of sunlight, seeking the salvation of a comfortable house to stay in. 
In Kansas, or Nebraska, wherever it may have been, there weren't a whole lot of natural markers that could guide the lost travelers. Any given direction to someone who didn't live in the area basically amounted to, well, you could, uh... Um, go a couple miles up the corn, uh, take a right down the dirt road to the other corn. There should be some corn and wheat on your right, and that's how you know you're going the right way. So, as in the case of most scary stories, the group got lost. Never wanting to admit defeat, however, they drove into the night, making many wrong turns at least every five minutes, until they found themselves on a wooded road that Mr. May's friend said he was certain his grandparents lived off of. Mr. Mays described the road basically as a dark path to hell. I wasn't entirely sure about how true this was because he got very excited and ridiculous with his explanation of the trees that almost grabbed the car and the red eyes of the countless animals looking at them from the darkness. Regardless, the typical horror tropes worked on most of the class and everyone was terrified. So, the group of guys drove on this dark road for about 15 minutes before they came to a clearing and a small building with lights in it. And what seemed to be a silo. They figured that at the very least, the people who lived here would be able to help them and find where the guy's grandparents lived. The whole idea of everyone knows everyone in these hick parts of the country fueled this futile hope. They pulled the car up near the building, realizing when they were out of the car that it appeared to be one of those kinds of places where they would store a whole bunch of chickens, not a home. Still, the lights were on, so they figured that they would at least give it a try. They approached the building as a group looking in the semi-open sliding door to find a big empty room hanging fluorescent lights that lit the room like it was daytime. And they couldn't see a soul, there were no cars, but one of Mr. May's friends was convinced that he'd seen someone as they pulled up, so they decided to go inside and to see if there was an office or maybe something where someone might still be working. Why else would they have this huge place lit up like that? There were no doors on the inside of the building. Again, it was just a giant empty hall. So, the group roamed around the property and over towards the silo. As they got closer, they noticed what appeared to be a cellar door. At this point, I remember Mr. Mays telling the entire class to learn from his idiocy. He told us that he hadn't seen many horror movies before that time, and he didn't think twice about approaching a creepy cellar in the middle of a dark, scary, foreign place. He said that approaching a door, approaching that door, was one of the biggest regrets he's ever made. Mr. Mays let the whole class know that he was going to tell us as much as he deemed appropriate about his experience. He felt that we were mature enough to handle it, but advised anyone who was squeamish to leave the class early. Several students quietly gathered their things and walked out of the door, a couple of them being stoners who saw this as an opportunity to smoke behind the school before their next class. I didn't give the announcement a second thought. Like I said, I was a um, sucker for this kind of stuff, and Mr. Mays was telling a story better than anything I had ever conjured up to this point. I wanted to learn from this guy, and even though I didn't believe much of the story, I figured it'd be at least a fun experience. After the class thinned a bit, Mr. Mays continued with his story. He told the remaining few that he and his friends opened that cellar door, releasing a smell that he only could describe as the most putrid thing my senses has ever experienced. The group was no longer concerned with finding the owners of the property, but was now set on finding the source of that smell. They went down the steps onto the cellar, which was only lit by single bulbs spaced evenly along the ceiling of the long hallway. No one spoke. Things had gotten too strange. The walls were lined with metal sheeting similar to that of a roofing on a farm. The hallway itself was crooked, and the ceiling constantly lowered and rose like a tunnel that was hastily dug and never touched up. 
there were sections where the boys could almost had to crouch in order to pass. The worst part, Mr. Mays told us, was that the light bulbs continuously flickered, sometimes acting like a strobe light, making it very difficult to move through the winding and unstable hallways. In hindsight, he was certain his mind was playing tricks on him, but he remembered seeing the flashes of things that just couldn't possibly be there. He said that when you are focused on sometimes, or if you are nervous, your mind can do that to you. It can simply revolt, showing you things or people that aren't there. He can you describe the hallway, and I was on the edge of my seat. The halls were winding and seemed to go on forever. Mr. Mays said or guessed that they were somewhere under a creepy forest that they'd driven through at least an hour before when they found a door. But he couldn't be sure. He said that when they came upon the door after walking for what seemed like several miles, it was a simple and a wooden one. It looked like it belonged on the outside of a suburban home and it had a nice design. It seemed to be freshly painted red and had a very nice knob and knocker on it. It was a door that belonged at the entrance of a nice house, not one that would be sitting in a dirt tunnel in the middle of god fucking nowhere. Mrs. May's friend grabbed the steel knocker and hit it against the door several times, mockingly but quietly uttering, is anyone home? The group waited it for another 30 seconds before their tension broke. The guy is next to the door well, shrugged his shoulders and went to walk back to his friends, but as he did, the light bulb between them sh surged and exploded. The, the, the boys shielded their eyes and looked back, their lone friend by the door as he lowered his hands and one of the metal sheets of the makeshift roof dropped. The, the edge of the sheets fell directly on the boy's forehead, slicing it open, and were sending a wave of blood down his face. The, the, the impact nearly knocked him out as he fell back against the door, knocking it open in the process. The entirety of the group rushed through the dim light to help their friend, barely noticingly the seemingly pitch black room now, that now laid before him. Mr. Mays was the first to make it to his friend's side, and he lifted the guy's head into his arms, immediately taking his jacket off and putting it over his forehead in an attempt to stop the bleeding. Once the group calmed down, Mr. Mays noticed that his arm had been bracing his friend's head, was now soaking wet. He was confused about this, and was attempting to sort it out when one of his friends started talking. He, he said something along the lines of, The lights! We have to go! Mr. Mace took notice. You know when you turn off a light and everything is almost pitch black except the light of the bulb dying out or cooling down? It was like that, but there were so many of them. At least 20 light bulbs had lit the room seconds ago and now only looked like little stars in the darkness. That was definitely terrifying, but that wasn't the scariest thing. Mr. Mays interrupted. There was still a very dim light coming from the hallway behind them, and though it was weak, it lit up a room just enough for them to see the shapes of tens of people standing less than ten feet in front of them. Mr. Friend, Mr. Mays' friend went to go say something as one of the bulbs to the right flickered to life. Let me interrupt you at this point to say that Mr. Maze was generally a playful guy. He had that tone of voice that makes you want to respond with, basically, he could say, Let's go jump off a cliff, guys, and you'd want to respond with, Alright, Mr. Maze, show us the way. That is a ridiculous statement, but it gets the point across. He was a very charismatic guy. The whole story up to this point was told like a campfire story. He had the voice and inflections of someone attempting to be mysterious and scary, which worked, but was noticeable. At this point, in his tale, I recall that changing completely. He was no longer attempting to spook anyone. I could tell that this section was difficult for him. Either that he was a very good actor, or was a very terrifying memory for him to relive. 
He told us that the light bulb came to life and illuminated the group of people in front of them. In the dim light, he could see children, at least 20 of them, in the visible light. They were all dressed in nightgowns that looked tattered or torn, stained in with something dark. Their hair was long. Every single one of them looked like they hadn't had a haircut since birth. Some of the children were almost completely obscured by the length of it, like something out of the ring. Every single one of them didn't even appear to have taken a nice shower or a bath their entire life. Mr. Mays told us that the most terrifying part of the whole thing was that none of the children were moving. They were standing, staring. Most of them were visible from the faint light reflecting off their eyes. His whole group was paralyzed with fear for the past several seconds when they heard what sounded like an animal in the distance yelping. The way it was described was like the sound of a dog crying, multiplied by ten. This spurred the group to life. Just as the children began to step forward, his friend grabbed the injured one and lift him, um, lifted him out of the room and into the hallway, and in an instant, Mr. Mays took another second to move and had difficulty finding his bearings. He reached to his left in an attempt to find a wall against him, but ended up finding a handle and then pulled it hard, never losing his vision on the children. He bolted for the door to he bolted for the door right as he noticed th he had grabbed onto it. A shower head that protruded from the cement of the wall. Reaching maybe a foot into the room. There was something that leaked from it, but it was too dim to tell what it was, but it was dark in color. He realized that it had been linking onto him, but he didn't care as there were now children stammering towards him as an animal cried in the distance and his friend was seriously injured. He then left the room and he made a point to emphasize that he could make out several more shower heads near the single one, near the dim light bulb. This is why I call them the showers. Mr. Mace told the class, I was transfixed, sitting far forward as, as my desk as it would allow, bracing for more. I slammed the red door behind me and ran through the hallway faster than I have ever run before or since. I made it back to the car and we drove out of there like a bat out of hell. A couple students snickered at this point over his use of words of hell. So when you're trick-or-treating tonight, make sure you know exactly where you're heading and don't go to any abandoned farmhouse. I mean, there aren't too many around here, but you're all smart kids. Except Jerry. The class laughed and the mood lightened and the bell rang for the passing period. Mr. Mace turned on the light and thanked everyone for listening and he reminded them about the paper due next week and told us to have a safe and happy Halloween. Students all around me were abuzz with theories about what they just heard. I bet it was some crazy Nazi hideout, said one girl. Uh, <laughs> I don't think so. I think there were probably all baby ghosts that were killed by a dog or something, said another. I couldn't theorize in the slightest. I was still caught up in the moment. The way that Mr. Mesa told a story in such detail that he included, it left me feeling like... Maybe I didn't get the full story. A couple days later, I stayed after class and asked him about how it really ended, what happened to his friend. He laughed and said that his friend was fine and that it honestly, he whispered this part. Probably due to some of the drugs that were on at the time. Don't tell anybody about the drugs, bit kid. Anne smiled and just simply left. I lived in that town for another couple of months, and then I was rapidly moved halfway across the country to Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I twisted the story around a bit and told it around campfires as I got older, and it was always a hit, but I always changed the ending, letting the friend die of blood loss or being dragged away by children. It wasn't until college that I got the chance to talk to Mr. Mays again. I went, to the co I went to college in northern New York, not for any reasons associated with the story, just college was a fun time for me. I continued being the same ham I'd always had been. It wasn't until sometime around my junior year that I ran into Mr. Mays again at the bar that I frequented. Initially, I couldn't be sure that the same person I saw lying with his head buried in his arm at the bar was Mr. Mays. The only trait that grabbed my attention that was similar was a sweater that he used to wear on his birthday during class that simply read, 
I'm the birthday boy. I told a group of friends that well, I was with to grab a table and I would join them in a second. Then I walked over to the man at the bar. Um, uh, Mr. Mays, is that you? I said, and then the man simply looked up at me. The man took a second to look at my face before he smiled and then put a hand on my shoulder and he said, Hey there, son. How have you been? I could smell a strong smell of whiskey on his breath, and his cheeks were flush. His, the look at his eyes told me that there was at least three sheets of wind, and he had probably no idea who I was. Um, Mr. Mays? <laughs> it, it's me, Jack. I was a student of yours a couple of semesters ago. About six or so years ago? His face changed a bit, and a general, genuine look of recognition set in. He took a calmer tone and said, How have you been, Jack? After that, we talked for a solid 20 minutes. I told him what I had been doing for the last several years, and he told me apparently he was still teaching at the same dank old high school doing the same old stick, as he called it. I asked if everything was alright, and he said they were good as they're ever going to be, or worse as they're ever going to get. It took me a moment to realize that I was an adult, having a conversation with another adult. Every time I had spoken to Mr. Mays previously, I had been a student, it had, well at least it had been a student-teacher relationship, but now it, I, he was just a guy having a drink with his friend at a bar. My friends eventually left and I continued to drink with Mr. Mays. He told me all about his divorce and his kids and the things he would, well, the things that I would never have asked or cared about previously, but now I genuinely cared. He was a real person to me, not just some idol anymore. This was a guy who had real problems and not the infallible teacher that I once thought he was. It had been several hours before I even brought up the story about the showers. Uh, well, I told him all about my history of urban legend scary stories and he just laughed, but when I mentioned a story that he had told us years ago, he almost seemed uncomfortable. He finished his whiskey and singled for another and he turned back to me and got very serious. Uh, listen, Jack. I don't know why I kept telling you that story year after year. That was what my therapist told me to do when I was younger. I had to tell people it, uh, to come to grips with it or some shit. Wait, wait, your therapist? Of course, Jack. You think something like that wouldn't fuck a person up? <laughs> wait, what? But I mean, I mean, you said you were all on drugs or something, right? Nobody was too terribly hurt. You were all okay. You said it wasn't even that bad. Of course we didn't, Jack. Why do you think I'm here right now? Tim fucking... You didn't make it, Jack! <laughs> fucking took him, they did. I don't even know. Cops told us we were just drunk. That we had wandered off and gotten taken by the wildlife. You didn't know. You didn't say it, Jack. I wish they'd have found the body, though. Then we could have shown them. It's a bad place, Jack. I don't know anything else to say. It's a bad place. <sighs> he, he would carry on for another couple of minutes, more about his friend and the fun they had before they went on the trip, and... <sighs> I, I let him talk, and it was only a few minutes later that his phone rang. It's been nice seeing you, Jackie. You got a good head on your shoulders, boy. Make sure you use it. Wait, um, uh, Mr. Mays, before you go. Yeah, Jack? Where'd you say this, that all this showers business took place? Where? Hell, didn't I mention it? It's somewhere outside Broken Bow, Nebraska. Fucking hell on earth, if you ask me. Mr. Mays walked out of a bar, waving at me running into the wall before eventually finding the door. That was the last time I would ever see him. I'd never be able to tell him the impact he had on my life, or rather, the impact his story had on me. 
He'd never know about the trip I took after graduation, almost mimicking the one that he and his friends had made. He would never know about the things I saw. He would never know that I went to the place and that the place was real. Why, you may ask? Well, he died about a month later. His liver failed on him. It's alright, though, because his family, his friends, was with him in the hospital room. He got to die around the people that cared about him, and that is all I can ask for a man like that. I experienced that place, too, several, several years later. Th that is where my story turns. The following story that's going to be the next part of this is how I found the showers, and why I'll never go anywhere near Nebraska ever again. I'll finish the story when I'm sober and my memory's clear enough. Till my next update, see you guys later. And that was the showers, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you enjoy that story because it's the best one probably I've ever read. It's not my favorite story in the world, however, there's no cliches perfectly written, the best grammar ever, and if you want an example for a good story, I'll link it in the description below. Th there's nothing wrong with this. Maybe a few cliches, but I don't notice them, and to be honest, I don't quite care. It's the best story probably on the wiki, and I plan on doing part two quite soon. This story was helped narrated by Otis Jiry. If you like his voice, you can find his channel in the description below. Thanks for watching. This is the perfect example for creepypasta. So, till I come out with my next part, I hope you guys enjoy.